Okay. This is for right? No, this this bio sent to me is for gift for the dollar I hope you can hear me. This is for gift. Yeah, she is next. So read hers and then um I don't want to be interrupting, so you check the chat and ask I anything. Whatever you say, I'll reply in the chat, okay. Yeah, so as I said, I don't, I don't want to be interrupting. So anything you ask, just check the chat. I will be giving the updates there or a response to it over there. Hello, gifts. Are you ready? Hello, gift. Okay, good. So, um, you can start. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi, guys. The best thing that happened to me was writing. The first time I learned to write, it was a boy. And the very moment I decided to dive into the ocean called poetry, still was this boy. Well, not yet to talk about me, but if this will better explain our team stylistics, using languages and style to explore meaning in poetry, then I should let you see this not so pretty side of me. Before that, I would like to engage us. So tell me, when and where did you discover your flair for poetry? At what point did you decide you wanted to be another Shakespeare? I can guess most of us didn't know what poetry was until we had our first death break from our high school crush. Back then, all the words just made so much sense to sit on those lines in our diaries and notes and journals. Those words, they were carefully crafted for our pains to fit in and we looked, oh boy, can I write? So you wrote more and more and more, enough to get you through that phase. So long it has something to do along with the lines of you broke me, now you see how indeed my heart bleeds. <laughs> you saw what I did, right? Like it's rhyme, the rhyming. We just made sure we were rhyming. You were new to the world of poetry, but you still understood that there are rules and styles message. No, this isn't to taunt you about the crush you broke you to the point of bleeding. This is to make you see you were on the right track all along. 
you knew what you were doing. Earlier, I promised to share my story. So here it is. Like you, I had no idea of what poetry really entailed. The styles, the figurative language, the types, the forms, the feminism, similes, metaphors, hyperbole, the puns. But, but I remember quite well that I made sure to rhyme every inserted as quiet as a dove, as dirty as a pig, as white as snow. This boy hurt me so bad, I couldn't even write it as a story because it didn't seem like the right way to communicate my feelings. Poetry found me and it eased me of my pain, despite the little idea I had of it. Am I saying poetry gives hope and comfort? Yes, if used rightly, if done well. The world is much more complex than it was back then. Now, it is not enough to simply rhyme, but it will be this time because you're here. In the moment of divination, I realized that we are unconscious of how much life changes us or how receptive we are to these changes. We don't even notice them. We flow with the rhythm, sync to our inner music, we sway to the beats that we only understand. Yeah, poetry is our lyrics, but music to others' ears, it is our recipe, but a processed meal to others' tongue. And what the taste, what the ear, is their perception of how beautiful we can build this gift. You are the painter. Your poetry is the masterpiece you create for the world to view. You need your black canvas, your easel, your paint brushes, your paint cans to make your heart a reality. A watercolor or coloring pencil won't do the magic. So the big question is, why are we here today? This is where we get to talk. Why are we here today? Why are you here right now? Why are you listening to this? What are your expectations? What do you hope to gain from this lecture series? We are here to understand the we are yet to understand the proper usage of stylistics. We are yet to understand poetry diversity to write poetry that illuminates to the darkest recess of heart, and most importantly, to write poetry that lives. For this lecture series, we have three speakers who are well-versed in the world of poetry and are willing to share their knowledge and experiences with us. The first speaker, Dr. No Fatima, is currently serving as an associate professor in the Department of English at Presidency University. She has worked as an assistant professor of English at Salma bin Abdul Aziz University, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. And she's, current, she's actively involved in contributing her research work, articles, and poems, and has published the same on reputed platforms. The second speaker, popularly known as Mr. Poetivist, is a writer, poet, and theater practitioner. Poetivist is with a country voice on unearthing visuals of unsaid narratives. He is champion, he has championed events like poetic justice at the barriers of the unknown and the unknowable. Poetry is a phantom script telling how rainbows are made and why they go away. And this is where you learn the art to create such magic. Welcome, and thank you for joining us.
All right, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gifts. That was a very wonderful um, speech. Thank you very much for joining right, us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gifts. That was a very wonderful. So quickly, we will be moving on to the next program with um, the speaker for today. All right. Okay. Uh, very good afternoon to everyone present there. Uh, as uh, okay, before I proceed with the screen sharing, I need to first of all. Uh, express my sincere gratitude to Ernest uh, Rights Hub for providing this wonderful platform. Uh, yes. Next, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to uh, express my de deepest gratitude to uh, the organizers of this program and uh, especially uh, uh, Mr. Boke D. Alpha for his amazing uh, coordination throughout. So let me share the screen now. Just give me a moment. Here it is. We'll go ahead. Once the screen is here, please let please let me know. I'm not able to see the screen by myself. How do I do that? Okay, it is being presented now. It, sh it should be it should be showing now. It is. Okay, it is being presented. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. I is. can see. I can see it. Yeah, thank you, thank you. So the topic for today's discussion is poetic language style and interpretation. We are going to be talking about, we're going to be discussing about uh, what is poetry basically. And we need to know how the language is adopted here, the style of this, and how we are going to be interpreting poetry with its style and language. So here we go with the next slide. Before I start, uh, I need to re uh, really talk about uh, the poets, okay, the eminent poets that I have chosen here. I was like a bit like, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about the poets before I proceed, uh, proceed further. So I took up uh, these favorite poets uh, uh, to name them, uh, Robert Frost, William Wordsworth, and Emily Dickinson. I have taken their uh, catchphrases actually uh, in order to make ourselves understand much better about what poetry is. Uh, as we all know, Robert Frost is uh, an American poet of 20th century. Uh, he has uh, written many poems. Uh, and what we uh, have got to understand about him is uh, that he has uh, he is a poet of, uh, uh, you know, he is a poet who wrote poetry for the people to talk about him. So 
analyze what is the kind of thing that the poets would think about to write for their poetry. So uh, this we will be definitely going further to understand about what it is. So now let us take up the other poet that is Wordsworth. As we all know, Wordsworth is the nature poet. Uh, and uh, he is the one who launched the romantic age along with Coleridge. Uh, he has talked about poetry as it is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. And why did he say that? Because the emotions, okay, uh, as a human being, we do have the emotions, we do have the feelings. And how we are uh, bringing those emotions across into words, okay, which, uh, which get constructed uh, with its meaning on its own. So he talks about the powerful feelings that one has that is to do with in the writing of poems. And we have another poet that is Emily Dickinson. Uh, I have some interesting fact to talk about, uh, to discuss about Emily Dickinson. As we all know, she is also uh, an American writer. She is of uh, American literary tradition, basically. And uh, when she started to write, uh, of course, she, uh, I mean, she started to write when uh, her father expired. And very much into writing poetry. When she wrote poetry, she started sec secluding herself from uh, the public life. Uh, she started to withdraw herself from society. And, uh, uh, you know, when she wrote the poems, nobody got to know that what she has written about. And uh, then when after she died, actually, her sister brought uh, her poems to the daylight and she got it published. They were 1,500 in numbers. And when they got published and recognized, uh, what we got to know about her poetry is all about, uh, you know, she, she, she wrote about, uh, I mean, her skillful imagery is all about uh, the life and the death. The, the huge transition that she has made from life to death is what is all explained. One of the poems that she has written is, uh, because I could not stop for death. So that is something to do with philosophical life, so philosophical uh, death, you know, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, perceptions that one can have about life. Uh, that is something to do with. But here, uh, let us come back to what the notion of poetry is. Uh, she has uh, considered that if I read if I read a book and it makes my body so cold, no fire ever can warm me. I know that is poetry. So that much of passion she had to write to poetry. So let us move ahead with the next slide. Um, okay, so now we are going to be talking about the main part uh, of our discussion, that is what is exactly the poetry, what exactly the poetry is. The word poetry actually began in word form, uh, which is descended from the ancient Greek, Greek uh, the word is poesis, which means to create. Uh, it can be something to create that comes out of your mind, okay, uh, the thought, the perception, okay, the powerful feelings, and that is to be written down in words. Poets like craftsmen still work for the raw materials of the world to forge new understanding and comment on what it is to be human. Because basically, when we call ourselves as human, we need to have the, I mean, of course, we do have the inherent feelings, okay, the innate feelings. So this is to do with the feelings, connected to the feelings uh, completely. Um, so that is what it is. Let's go ahead. What do the poets do? Words to express the poet's ideas and feelings about a subject. As I already discussed that, poets do write about, it is a powerful pack of ideas and feelings, the thoughts and the emotions, okay, that which they bring in the words. Uh, as uh, as we know that poetry is the homogeneous voice of poet, while uh, we consider the other genres of literature being the heterogeneity, uh, you know, having the heterogeneity language in it. But poems uh, is where we find the homogeneous voice of a poet alone. These words need to be precisely right on several levels. They must sound right, okay, whatever the right, the words that they have chosen, the poets have chosen to write, okay, um, they must have, they must sound right to the listener, even as they delight his ear. It should be pleasing. It has to have some rhythm, okay, some musical qualities in it, uh, which is involved. And when you read out a poem, okay, you get to enjoy it. Okay, that is what the effect of poetry is. They must have a meaning along with it, yes, of course, because the meaning is something to do with the understanding, with the, uh, with the deeper ideas about, you know, uh, the nuances, the deeper subtleties of um, 
Uh, the ideas, which might have been unanticipated, but seems to be the perfectly right one. They must be arranged in a relationship and placed on the stage, on the page, uh, in ways that are at once easy to follow. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I'm not able to see that slide. It's okay. Because my picture is what is coming there. Okay, that are at once easy to follow. So what I mean to say is the relationship that is being connected there from words to one word to another, okay, that are interlinked, that are juxt juxtaposed throughout the poem. Okay, so that is what we can find um, in a poem, okay, understanding a deeper understanding to human thought and feelings and so on and so forth. Uh, I have taken this uh, very simple poem just to analyze how a poem can be written, what language can be uh, written, I mean, in what language it can be written, how simple it can be found. Uh, so uh, I prefer warm fur, uh, perfect fire. I want everyone to understand this, the uh, complete idea of it. You, you will enjoy when you read it and the musical, uh, you know, instruments, items that whatever you find there. I prefer warm for a perfect fire to lie beside a cozy lap where I can nap an empty chair when she's not there. I want heat on my feet, uh, on my feet, on my nose. No cat I remember dislikes December inside. So it's a very simple poem. It's uncomplicated. And we here we can find anybody, any layman, any normal person, any commoner can read the lines and understand the inter and interpret the ideas behind this poem. So this way also a poem can be written, which was written by Marilyn Singer, uh, basically. So let's go to the next slide. Here I have somewhat complicated one. Okay, let me discuss about it once I finish reading this. This was written by Billy Collins and the poem name is Litany. Uh, here the poem goes this way. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. I want uh, you know, uh, you know, the audience to just come closer to the ideas of its meaning to understand what it is written about. See, uh, basically here it is targeted with metaphors. Okay, uh, metaphor is the uh, literary device, the poetic poet uh, poetic device that which is used here. And uh, uh, we'll 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 discuss on metaphor a little bit later. Let us understand that metaphor is nothing but the comparison which is made to a person. It could be a person. It could be anything. Okay, the comparison, the direct comparison is made. You are the bread. Let's understand in this manner. You are the bread and the knife, the crystal goblet and the wine. You are the dew on the morning grass and the burning wheel. Uh, whatever the uh, bold letters are given here, bold words are written. You know, these are all the metaphors that are acted on a person, you know. So you are the white apron of the baker and the marsh birds suddenly in flight. However, you are not the wind in the orchard, the plums on the counter or the house of cards. And you are certainly not the pine-scented air. There's just no way that you are the pine-scented air. It is possible that you are the fish, fish under the bridge, maybe even the pigeon on this on the um, general's head, but you're not even close to being the field of cornflowers at dusk. So whatever it is written here, it is it is a satire, okay, basically, let me talk about the satire. And here the poet is trying to bring some kind of, uh, you know, uh, it could be the rebuke, it could be a flattery. Okay, first of all, let us talk about the positive side of life. It could be the praises uh, or flattery let us talk in that manner which would be applicable to this poem as well so at the beginning lines to the, till the half of the poem the poet has talked about the positive side of life about a person by giving the metaphors here and uh, that is all about the praises okay he's trying to compare a person to something something you know all those praises and then he's trying to flatter okay so it ends with in that notion uh, i remember on uh, one of the uh, poems of Shakespeare, uh, yes, uh, which goes this uh, way as the title, the my, my mistress eyes are nothing like sun. My mistress eyes are nothing like sun. This again can be acted as the uh, praise or, uh, or, or a flattery. So it is like that. Uh, it actually is to uh, mock the perfection and romantic idealism of love. This is what the poet is trying to uh, bring in here. 
So let us go to the next. Here, uh, let us talk about the elements of poetry. Uh, we have these many elements of poetry, uh, that which begins with is form, line, stanzas, rhyme, pattern, and rhythm. So let us discuss each one. Okay, let us talk about uh, the very foremost thing is uh, we have taken up form. We have different forms of poetry writing. That which begins is, let us talk about sonnet. Sonnet is what exactly? Sonnet is a poem of 14 lines. Uh, it was actually invented by, by Dante in 13th and 14th century. And uh, they are comprised of two. Uh, that is, one is uh, categorized as Petrarchan sonnet. The second is English sonnet. And we do have Shakespeare writing poems. I mean, he belongs. I mean, he's an he's he was an English man. So English poem category is under where he wrote sonnets. And there is. Uh, uh, I mean, there is a difference between uh, the Petrarchan sonnet and also the English sonnet. Let us talk about Petrarchan sonnet. We do have 14 lines there. And uh, the uh, 14 lines, it is made up of the first um, uh, six, uh, sorry, eight lines uh, is what is called as, uh, um, uh, is what is called as, uh, sorry to... Um, uh, I'm not getting that. The second, uh, the second is what is sestered. So we do have in English uh, uh, sonnet, okay, that is categorized into two again, uh, into three, uh, into four. That is uh, the four first three are quatrains, and the last one that is of two lines. First three are quatrains. That is four lines. Uh, each quatrain is made up of, and the last two, which is the couplet, which is made up of just two lines. So that is uh, that is the English sonnet. So now let us talk about ode. What is ode? It is a type of uh, lyrical stanza. Uh, the structure of ode is designed to praise or glorify uh, something. Um, it can be anything for that matter. And uh, we do have uh, here again some categories, Pindar ode, uh, Horatian ode, or even uh, irregular ode. So uh, when when the tr when the poet is trying to describe ode, uh, he is trying to bring in some kind of literary device here. Okay, let's say he talks about uh, the personification. Uh, he brings in the personif personification here. What what does personification mean? That means the inanimate object is brought to life in poetry. So uh, it is something like a person, which is the person, uh, I mean, the thing is being acted as a person. So such kind of personification are brought here in the writing of odes. Uh, apart from the personification, the poet uses adjectives uh, so as to make uh, them understand, I mean, them write clearly, lucidly about what their thought is all about uh, over any idea. Uh, so that is about ode. Coming to lyric, lyric is uh, something to express the personal feelings um, of a poet. Okay, it could be the feelings or thoughts, or it could be the expression of any idea. Uh, you know that is to be brought in here in words. Uh, these these are again uh, we have we do have the broad categories of lyric. That is uh, lyrical poem. As we all know, uh, one among them is lyrical ballads, which was written by uh, William Wordsworth, as we all know about that. Coming to second is dramatic uh, poem, and the third is epic poem. So coming to elegy, though I've not brought all these things, all these ideas here, but I, I felt like let me discuss on those uh, ideas. So here we talk about elegy. What is elegy? Elegy is an expression or tragic uh, event Okay, this is uh, this is written on the you know for the uh, this is a lament uh, for the dead actually. Okay, it has the mournful uh, notion behind. Okay, uh, the person who has the the person or the beloved who must have uh, departed the world. Okay, it has got to do something to do with that. Uh, you know about. Uh, that uh, kind of missing which is which is which can be found uh, there in a poem so let us talk about satire what is satire this is what we actually were discussing about in the poem that was shown just before the slide uh, that was a satire humorous satire and what satire basically is satire is nothing but uh, the poet uses the humor um, he uses irony he uses exaggeration uh, and also he uses uh, uh, he uses some kind of ridiculing effect here with the help of the words 
uh, in order to expose or criticize the humans. Uh, it could be uh, any kind of stupidity or vices. So this is what it is to do with satire. Uh, coming down to, the, to these given lines, every poet uses the form. When the poet decides to write a poem, he has to uh, make his mind in what category, in what kind of, uh, in what form of uh, poem he's going to be writing there. That most effectively express what he or she wants to convey to other human beings. Traditional poetry used to follow very strict forms. Yes, we all know that. One kind of poetry is free verse. Free verse is nothing but the blank verse, or uh, otherwise called as heroic verse, which was uh, used by Shakespeare in most of his sonnets. Okay, uh, wherein uh, there is no restriction, there is no some, you know, some kind of uh, rules or regulation that to be followed, okay, in order to write about, you know, in order to have a pattern, rhythmic pattern in the poetry, there is no such thing. So that's the reason it's mentioned, it's been uh, called as free verse, which is most often used in modern times these days, and it presents a multitude of possibilities. The poet uses free form to make the poem fit the contents and to express the mood of feeling. This we have already discussed. Poet tries to write about his free flow of mind, you know. So let us go ahead with the lines. It is lines are nothing but the vehicle of the author's thoughts and ideas. As we all know, the building blocks to create a poem, the words of which uh, each line proceed as usual from left to right. Okay, uh, the poet poet has its own way of writing. So he chooses to write left till the right, or somehow uh, you know as he finds better about it. But they curiously end where the where poet wants them to stop. Therefore, some are of equal length. Okay, we do fine, and some are not. Besides the length and margining of the first word in each line, punctuation, let us talk about that. Punctuation, full stop, comma, you know, double inverted, sorry, uh, semicolon, colon, all these matter a lot. Along with this, there is a meaning also behind which it is written. Okay, we do understand when we read the poem, when we go through the poem, when we glance through a poem, we get to understand all these uh, technical ideas uh, behind which the poem is written. And what it is, uh, you know, what it contains uh, in the help of understanding of a poem. At times, the poet wants us to make a full stop, yes. Other times, a gentle or slight pause, yes. And even others, perhaps a sudden break and so on. So it all is ultimately nothing but the sensations, the feelings, the thoughts and other things. So let us uh, talk about stanzas now. The lines, okay, we do have, uh, we do write a poem and each poem is separated uh, from one uh, paragraph to another. Paragraph is nothing, but we, do, we don't call it as paragraph, we do call it as stanzas. The cluster of lines, okay, let's say two lines, three lines, or even four lines, or even more than that. Okay, uh, so the lines in the poem are most often divided into sections, looking at some sort of paragraphing, hence we call it stanzas. A stanza, therefore, is the grouping of the lines, sort of like a paragraph, as we discussed. One way to identify a stanza is to count the number of lines. Uh, thus, couplet, couplet is two lines, tercet is three lines, quatrain is four lines. So it, it, is, it, is, it is this way that which has been written, you know, if it is written in two lines, we do call it as couplet, three line, tercet. Four lines, Scott Rain, Sinquain, five lines, Estet, six lines. Sometimes it's called a, a sec, sec sane and seven lines, Septed. Uh, then coming to the next is, uh, let us discuss on rhyme. Okay, what is rhyme? Words that have different beginning sounds, but whose endings sound alike. Uh, so... Uh, example, uh, rhyme Rhyme is what, let's understand that, the beginning sounds whose endings also sound alike. Um, it, this is all about the sound, the pattern that we uh, we write uh, the poem into. Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's understand the examples. Uh, as you can see, the bold uh, letters given here, time, slime, mime. So what do you find here? The musical effect in each of the words. Okay, this is the way that the poem is written and the ending of beginning sounds whose ending sound goes alike. 
uh, yes, coming to the double rhymes, include the final two syllables, example, revival. So we can understand the double rhymes here. That is uh, two syllables, as we as we know what syllable is, revival, okay, that which is the work of the consonant and the vowels together, right? So triple rhymes include the final three syllables, that is greenery. So it goes that way, machinery, scenery. Coming to the next slant rhyme or half rhyme. Final consonant words of the words are the same, but the initial consonants and the vowel sounds are different. Let us understand. See, these things can be understood with the help of the examples only. And uh, when we uh, when you see the examples, it is soul, oil, fall. That last ending, you know, that consonant is what makes slant rhyme or considered as half rhyme. Uh, near rhyme, if the wall, if the final wall sounds are the same, but the final consonant sounds are slightly different. Examples, fine, rhyme, poem, going. So uh, these are the, uh, you know, you can find the wall sound there. Okay, that goes the same similar sound and the final consonants which are different. Side rhymes or I rhymes, uh, words which are spelled the same, okay, but are pronounced differently. So just like enough, of, cough, trough, bof, bo, sorry. So it goes that way. Um, let us uh, understand the rhythm now. What is rhythm? Rhythm is the heart of poetry in the sense like the way that is written, the stresses that is found, you know, that the stresses that are found. Verbal stresses into a regular pattern of accented syllables separated by unaccented syllables. So we do find uh, in the rhythm both the syllables. One could be the accent, uh, accented one, and the other goes with unaccented, as we find here in example. I thought I saw... I thought you know that is stressed and then uh the, the other one is not uh accented i saw a pussy cat you know so that goes the musical effect that it goes with the word you know throughout the line that makes us analyze how the rhythm uh, rhythm is found there meter organization of voice patterns in terms of both the arrangement of stresses and their frequency of repetition per line of verse. So meter is nothing but the verse uh, stresses. So let me, uh, let me, uh, you know, bring some, uh, you know, some title that I have in my mind um, uh, that is to do with where shall I go this summer? Uh, you know, um, so that is about uh, the sonnet. That is a sonnet of uh, uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, poets. That is Shakespeare. So there he has written. Uh, there is another line also that comes to my mind: "To be or not to be." Okay, to be or not to be. One is accented, the other is unaccented. So this is again the arrangement of stresses we do find here. So um, that is what is called a meter. Uh, coming to feet, traditional line of meter poetry contains a number of rhythmical units. So that goes this way. The rhythmical unit, you know, that goes to be, you know, that unit goes together. That acts as the feet. The feet in a line are distinguished as a recurring pattern of two or two or three syllables. So poetic devices. So let us talk about, uh, this is what I was discussing about, you know, uh, in due course of time, uh, you know, sometimes there. So here, once again, let me discuss uh, uh, poetic devices. What are they and how are they going to have its own effect, you know, their own effect in poetry? These are the arrangement of words which assist the writer in developing cogent expressions pleasing to his readers. Uh, poetry today is read silently, it must still carry with it the feeling of being spoken aloud. So even though poetry is written silently, uh, you know, uh, uh, poetry is written, but uh, the words are going to actually express how and what it is written. So that is spoken aloud. Okay, that is what the beauty of poetry is. So let us talk about this, uh, these uh, few uh, poetic devices. Alliteration, that means repeated consonant sounds placed near each other. See, such kind of expressions can also be mentioned in the poems. So that goes this way, fast and furious. The sound, you know, the first uh, consonant sound, which is repeated, okay, that fast and furious, you know, that is alliteration. Peter and Andrew patted the pony at Ascot, you know, that sound which is repeated, per, per, you know, 
that is alliteration. Coming to assonance, repeated all sounds placed near each other. That is like this. It goes. He's a bruising loser. You know, repeated all bruising loser. Consonants goes this way. Repeated consonant sounds at the ending of words placed near each other. Uh, so, um, so this is something to do with the consonant consonants. Okay. So if there was an example to be shown, it would have been good. It's okay. Let's go to the next one. Finding meaning in poetry. The poet is trying to analyze the meaning through his poems, uh, you know, in order to make him, uh, make the readers understand what better they can connote, uh, uh, you know, the meaning to it, you know, uh, connote uh, the idea. An ordinary object, event, animal, or person to which we have attached meaning and significance. So here are a few um, uh, sentences that I have taken, the verses, otherwise you can call it. Flag to represent, you know, one word connotes with something okay it has its own significance so that can be associated with it always lion goes with courage wall goes with separation and things like that and here it is to do with simile okay this is also the literary device which used which is used by the poets often in their poems and uh, this is the direct comparison of two unlike things using like or as so these are the tools uh, the emotional or psychological or social undertones of a word okay they try to consider one thing to another and they say that this is like so and so okay uh, life is like roses you know so the example is that way the emotion uh, its implications and associations apart from its literal meaning so it has its own meaning you know that which is associated with the literal meaning that is how it is implied the meaning of which is implied so that is considered as simile so the use of language to help reader activate senses once uh, we start reading the poem okay to something like we started to activate our uh, mind okay activate our thought and the process uh, of thinking goes a long way um, about anything that we uh, we 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 deal with okay in the poem has how we understand that poem so here we go with the next, um, yes, sound and meaning, which all makes sense in the poem, which is all what uh, the poem can be uh, really described about, can be understood or apprehended, you know. Uh, the function of poetry is not only sounds, but meaning or experience through sounds. So the words are written and those words are giving some sound, you know. So behind that, what do you find? What do we find is the experience of a person. Okay. Uh, the think uh, the the thought uh, process of a person so this brings um, you know uh, the sound to uh, life uh which is which is how it is considered in good poetry sound doesn't exist for its own sake or for decoration but to enhance meaning one way the poet may reinforce meaning through sound is with anomatopoeia so what is this anomatopoeia this is also an, a kind of expression that is used by the poet in some of his poems uh, based on their ideas of writing it anomatopoeia doesn't only have to express the sound of animals okay as we all know this is nothing but the sound of animals such as uh, you know his cock a doodle do bow you know these are the expressions made by the animals but to express uh, the sounds and movements of actions this can be these can, can be considered in poetry for example the harness jingles you know jingles that is the word the monas creak you know so it goes that way the expression uh, goes that way coming to the next slide a short I, okay, let us understand this. The poet writes small letter I, you know, uh, I mean, uh, when he writes, uh, when he uses uh, a small word and uh, it has a sound of I there. A short I is often often associated with smallness, like little, sip, kid, okay, that I sound, you know, I'm talking about sip, kid, inch, im. So all these are small words, actually. So they can also have some association with their meaning uh, that is to do with the smallness, you know, 
a long o okay coming to o which is a letter that again gives the sound of o okay which is associated with melancholy the sadness okay the sorrow sorrowfulness or anything to do with death also we can say and the words also uh, the words that are written here are synonymous to melancholy right moan groan moan tall uh, down gloom moody forlorn woe Yes, there seems to be enough of an association between some sounds of certain words and their corresponding meanings or ideas to assess an intrinsic relationship. A word like uh, flicker through its sound suggests its meaning. Flicker is nothing but that is a uh, moving light. Coming to the next slide, here I have taken a poem uh, that is uh, eight o'clock, the, the title of which is, he stood, I want to, uh, the audience to please get closer to this meaning and analyze what it is written about. He stood and heard the steeple sprinkle the quarters in the morning town. One, two, three, four, um, to marketplace and people. It tossed them down, strapped, noosed, nine his hour. He stood and counted them and cursed his luck. And then the clock collected in the tower. So when we associate, when we when we keep when we start reading and when we go uh, go through from one word to another, we try to analyze the idea, we try to interpret, we try to uh, bring the complete uh, you know the depth of uh, its meaning you know uh, I mean uh, to our senses, and we get to understand that it has a sense behind. It has it could be the story, it could be anything to do with the idea of the poet. It could be the experience also so when we go to the next slide i have written some questions here about that poem what uh, what is that poem about uh, the, what is this poem about this poem is about a person about to be hanged in the town center see there are people who who understand who interpret the poems in a very correct manner sometimes it does happen that people do not understand it in the manner that it is written certain things of course, would imply them, you know, to make them analyze it much better. And sometimes, you know, it it is it is completely open. You know, the poet leaves the idea open throughout the poem to guess what you think, what you consider, what it what you interpret the lines to be about. You know, it could again be that manner. Although I'm not talking about this particular idea here to the poem that was read out okay here this poem is actually having a very good meaning that is to do with what has been written here this poem is about a person who is about to be hanged in the town center the clock chimes every 15 minutes counting down the time of his execution what is the contribution so we get to understand that so and so thing is happening now what is the contribution of the bolded words okay this is to do with c and str so which are the repetition, uh, you know, uh, in the poem, which are given there, sounds slow the reader down, helping to give special emphasis to the last word in the poem. So these bold words have its own effect, okay, that's, that has its own emphasis uh, to the meaning. What is the effect of the internal comma in the last stanza? The internal comma places emphasis on the last word in stanza, struck, giving it enormous force so when the meaning is applied when the meaning is implied it has its own effect to poem so that is what the reflection of ideas being brought by the poets in the words in a poem what does the imagery of the clock collecting its strength suggest so uh, you know we have we do have the poems uh, you know uh, fulfilled with imagery uh, the style you know uh, every poet has its own way of uh, depicting things uh, writing you know has his own style to maintain throughout the poem so this is how they are known they are recognized for their imagery for their uh, you know uh, kind of skillful uh, of course imagery to be brought there in the lines which reinforces the idea behind it. Um, so that was uh, the presentation of this PPT. Uh, I hope uh, things have been smooth uh, all the way. And thank you.
for listening patiently. Thank you for listening patiently. Yes, thank you very much, Doc. That was an excellent presentation. Very insightful. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity, Okay, Alpha. I really appreciate your coordination throughout, and it was really worthwhile. Um, thank you so much once again. Yeah. So um, there, there's one. Uh, I think there are two or yeah, two questions. I don't know if you're available to okay. let, uh, answer them. Two questions before you go. Mm -hmm. I, I I could not read actually. I don't find the chat box here. I don't know if where can I find chat box? Okay, so um, the first question. Okay, so um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. All right. Yes, please. So the question that I asked, the person wants to know: Do punctuations have um, um, effects on the meaning of a poem, as in when the omission or the addition of punctuation can it affect? the meaning a poem gives uh would you please repeat please repeat uh, um the question goes does the meaning um does the addition or omission of punctuation punctuation marks mm -hmm change the meaning of a poem yes got it got it yes of course it does change because there is a continuation of perception uh the notion which is implied there by the poet uh you know usually uh you know it has the it has some kind of connection from one to another say for instance comma is not given there and uh yes of course the ideas are not expressed that well okay as it is written by the poet so there would be the interruption in the ideas there would be the interruption in the you know disconnectedness in the uh, you know ideas supplied there by the poet so that might not give the clear understanding of uh, the uh, notion you know behind uh, the theme about the theme yes it does affect i hope i have answered to this question All right, so um, the, I think I have a follow-up question myself. Does it mean that would you or the writer or poet um, intentionally decide to take uh, away, let's say, a punctuation mark just for uh, um, a stylistic effect or to create a meaning in poem? I don't know if the question is clear. <laughs> so you mean to say that? Uh... I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. I, I would like you to repeat again so that I can. So since the addition or the addition of a poem mm -hmm. can change addition the or deletion of, of punctuation, poem, as you said, uh -huh. would, can a poet uh -huh. make a conscious decision to take away one punctuation mark just so they could create a specific meaning they want to create? or to, you know, work, use it for a stylistic effects, you know, and in, in the end, giving it meaning. Yes, yes, it, it does affect, and uh, that is what I said. Every poet has his own style of writing things. And uh, when we are trying to delete it, when, you're, when we are trying to omit a punctuation from there, the meaning doesn't complete, 
uh, there so it 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 has a lot to do with uh, the poet's style okay uh, of uh, um, is yes, describing things there so that is actually required okay we cannot delete it we don't have any authority to delete it and it's not open for the people to uh, choose or not choose okay based on your ideas it is not like that and what is written by the poet is what is written and that is what is to be followed and therefore uh, no addition or deletion can be made and it does has its own the poet has its own style to write it and of course there is a meaning behind writing that which goes with the interpretation of a poem hope i have answered this question okay that's that's very insightful thank you very much thank you so much thank you so much mr okay once again the next question is does the type of language affect the meaning of a poem um as in the choice in language the diction <laughs> Yes, yes, it does affect because uh, we do write poetry. Okay, when we when we start writing poetry, we have an idea in our mind, and that idea uh, has its own uh, way of you know. We try to portray it through the words, and the words are nothing but they are the reflection of ideas, right? So when we try to change that word to another word, let's uh, you know make it synonymous to some other word, uh, it it gives a different impact altogether. Okay, it might be some somewhat similar to the notions or idea but it cannot thoroughly be the same uh, you know um, description the poet is trying to uh, talk about such thing so it it might change yeah it could be the features you know of writing uh, poetry that could change uh, of uh, uh, it could be the syntactic lexical law or even semantic uh, meaning which is implied uh, to it so so it goes that way did i did i address it uh, right 